So this is about UAV cam. Uh, some of you are already familiar with this protocol. Briefly, uh, this is an onboard communication solution for hard real-time uh, intravehicular networks. Um, I'm going to explain what UAV can is with the help of this uh, simple model. Uh, some of you might consider it a bit oversimplified, because it is. Um, so briefly, we have two dimensions here. One dimension um, uh, denotes uh, the difficulty of uh, verification and validation of a protocol, which is important for safety-critical applications, and the other dimension represents the level of abstraction that the protocol provides for the application, and we're going to use it in order to help you understand what is the place of UAV CAN compared to other solutions. So we have uh, several broad categories here, and as you can see, the upper left corner is dedicated to modern software-defined vehicles, and it is something that we are actually targeting. So we can add some protocols on here. Uh, or CPWM and DDS, they are vastly different, and uh, you can see it reflected with this model. Our CPWM and similar basic analog protocols are very cheap to validate, obviously, because they are simple, they are predictable. Unfortunately, their level of abstraction and level of uh, communication features provided by them is uh, too limited. Um, and then DDS, you are probably familiar with that protocol. It is widely used in uh, various industrial and IoT applications. Uh, it... Uh, at the moment, it doesn't enjoy much use in safety critical onboard networks because it is very complex. The state space of a DDS deployment is very extensive and that makes it very difficult to validate and to ensure its uh, predictable, predictable behavior. So we can throw more protocols. Perhaps you can recognize some of them. MQTT is particularly popular in IT these days. Uh, can aerospace can open, they are very similar. Airing uh, 429 is uh, basically a basic signaling protocol, which is very low level, but at the same time very robust. It's been widely used in uh, aerospace applications for decades. Still use it, by the way. So, some extra protocol. This is not a protocol. <laughs> some extra protocols here. Um, AFDX, uh, it's another communication standard, which uh, this day is used in uh, modern airliners and uh, other managed applications for safety critical systems such as fly-by-wire, where the safety demands are the highest, higher than anywhere else. Uh, it's based on Ethernet, so that's important to keep in mind. It's Yes, David, it's Ethernet. It's, I know it sounds unusual because it's technology which is borrowed from uh, consumer applications, and uh, it's a very interesting solution. So we can throw, say, I2C and TCP on here just uh, for the sake of general reference, although they are not really relevant to our effort. They are designed for completely different applications. And that makes them belong in the, in the sector of non-viable solutions. And finally, this is the place of UAV camp. Or at least, this is the place that we want, that we are striving to bring it into. You can probably like, perceive that the upper left corner of this diagram is like the holy grail of onboard communication. Something that is very easy to validate, and at the same time it provides rich abstractions, allowing developers to design complex applications easily. So that is, we are trying to push it towards the upper left corner, and whether we are successful or not, that remains to be seen. So, how are we actually doing that? We have a set of core design goals which uh, form the basic principles that guide our design decisions and uh, our engineering. Obviously, it's a real-time protocol. It's designed for real-time systems. It should be usable and it should be viable, a viable choice for uh, safety critical systems. And at the same time, we want it to be simple so that it's easy to validate a UAV CAN deployment to ensure that the entire safe space, state space is explored and it's safe for use. Um, it's lower head, and you will see how we manage to achieve that. We're going to cover all of this uh, um, design goals briefly. 
UAVKN depends on uh, deterministic transports. For now, you know that uh, it supports CAN, and uh, later I'm going to also mention our efforts to bring UAVKN to other protocols, later about that. Uh, UAVKN can be implemented using only constant complexity algorithms, which is very important for predictability, and finally, data structures that are exchanged over UAVKN uh, they are always bounded, so worst case memory footprint, worst, worst case uh, serialization, deserialization complexity is predictable. Speaking of real time, uh, there is a common misconception, or perhaps this is our failure because we don't manage to communicate this point clearly enough. Uh, people sometimes ask us questions, uh, what if they, is uh, the performance of their uh, control loops on their unmanned vehicles is going to be affected if they actually migrate to UAVCAN. Uh, how does it compare against their CPWM? And actually, it, uh, can, it, it can compete with their CPWM. Uh, in this diagram, we assume a standard one uh, megabit per second uh, CAN bus, and in the case of CANFD, the uh, uh, second bit rate is around eight megabit per second. You can see that it can, it can actually compete with the best protocols that are designed specifically for motor control in unmanned vehicles. So the important message here is that UAVCAN is at least as capable as dedicated protocols. Um, if you want more technical details, uh, refer to the specification. It's, uh, it's very extensive, and we spent a lot of time writing it. This is what we believe will make you again a great choice for safety critical deployments. First of all, there is no such thing as a bus master. It's entirely decentralized. And every node, every uh, participant of the bus has the same, has equal rights when it comes to participation on the network. Anything can, uh, can uh, any particular, any node can start communication. Uh, there is virtually no shared state uh, shared state is a bit of a complicated subject. I'm, I don't want this presentation to be technical, but briefly, it makes a communication system fragile uh, because uh, when the shared state becomes inconsistent, certain failure modes become uh, important to analyze. It makes uh, verification validation complex. That, in turn, enables uh, another feature, which is, uh, we call it power up and go. Uh, basically, any node can join the network and begin communication virtually instantaneously. There is no such thing as uh, establishment of connections uh, or other procedures that need to be performed before a node can actually begin operation on the bus. And redundant transports are first-class citizens. Uh, support for redundant communication transport, redundant interfaces is built into the protocol. And the protocol provides uh, a convenient abstraction for the application so that the application perceives the communication channel as one virtual link which is actually based on several, several independent physical connections. Um, and I think we managed to find a pretty uh, satisfactory solution that allowed us to implement the support easily. And again, another reference to the specification. If you want to learn the details, please read it. It's interesting. Last but not least, uh, it is simple in terms of implementation. Uh, there exists a, a reference implementation called LeapConard. It's MIT licensed, by the way. Uh, it contains approximately 1,000 uh, source lines of code, so pretty compact. And it's on GitHub. Uh, there will be links at the end of this presentation. So in order to achieve this level of simplicity and uh, ease of validation, we had to introduce some design trade-offs, of course. Uh, first of all, we don't support uh, non-reliable transports, which means that uh, a message loss is highly unlikely in a properly functioning uh, UAVCAN deployment. The architecture is static, which means that there are no self-describing messages, uh, no dynamic message formats, everything must be a communication schema must be defined beforehand, and this is desirable for the domain that we are targeting. Uh, and another thing that is tightly related, there is no such thing as arbitrary size data, data objects, which means if you want to define a dynamic array, for example, as, as shown here, 
you have to specify its maximum, its worst case size. That allows the protocol to avoid reliance on variable complexity routines. Very simple case study. This, this product is built on a microcontroller of NXP LPC 11C24. It's, maybe it's a bit obsolete nowadays, but uh, no matter. Uh, it contains 32K from 8K of RAM, and it runs UAV CAN. This uh, thing, by the way, it's interesting on its own. Uh, it's an electro-permanent magnet. It is used for uh, attachment of uh, payload to unmanned flying vehicles and other applications. It's manufactured by Nikodron. You can Google it if uh, you care about this sort of thing. Really interesting. Another interesting example, it's, uh, it's a motor controller, an open source motor controller built on a not so capable MCU. Uh, at least when it comes to memory, 16K RAM, 64K ROM, no real time operating system. It runs UAV CAN, and this thing is really tiny. It's like, like this, lead, very compact. Just to summarize, again, this is, uh, the variance of these numbers can be huge. So it is important to keep in mind that these this are not exact numbers, but it gives you a rough idea what you can do with memory you have. Canary Space is, of course, a very simple protocol. It is not a bad protocol and can be implemented in a very uh, constrained systems. Uh, you, the takeaway message is that compared to uh, DDS solutions, UAV CAN is pretty lean. So, last but not least, how do we make it simple? And by last, I mean it's the last of our design goals. The complexity of a UAV CAN implementation is uh, comparable to Canary Space. Uh, some of you may be familiar with this protocol. Um, the specification itself is quite compact, and that doesn't mean that it's not detailed. Um, we estimate, at least uh, it's my personal understanding, my personal assessment is that a sufficiently experienced developer can implement UAV CAN from scratch in approximately one man month. Of course, if the implementation needs to be generic, then the effort would be slightly higher, but for a particular application, this assessment should hold true. Uh, and uh, also, the Simplicity argument extends not only to the uh, to implementation of UAV CAN, but also to its uh, usability. You can easily integrate UAV CAN into your application thanks to our high quality reference implementations. They are all MIT licensed. They are all hosted on GitHub. Uh, we support C, C++ in Python, and there is also Rust implementation, which is sort of a work in progress. If you care about trust, we could really use your help. Now, those of you who are familiar with the ROS will find this data type definition very familiar because it uh, derives sort of from, uh, from ROS. Uh, there are some similarities. Uh, basically, you specify type on the left, uh, name on the right, and that makes a data field. Uh, you can see on the line number 16 how we constrain arrays, which I already mentioned, and uh, these uh, two things at the bottom are static verification hooks. It's a bit of a sophisticated, complicated thing, but uh, in the end it allows us to generate extremely efficient serialization and deserialization code. Uh, we perform very in-depth analysis of bit layouts, and uh, again, specification is your friend if you want to learn more, it's, it's a great feature. Um, for developers, it's easy to use. For, for developers who build their applications on top of UAV CAN, it's easy to use because we provide very convenient communication abstractions. Uh, publish, subscribe, many people are familiar with that. Uh, remote procedure call, uh, like a request response exchanges. There are two basic communication abstractions which are built into UAV CAN and um, semantic overhead. And what we mean by semantic overhead is that uh, a working UAV CAN deployment is very similar to what you would get if you were to just exchange raw data over the wire without any additional protocol. Um, they sometimes call it a zero-cost abstraction. If 
you're familiar with this, with this, with this term. It comes from software engineering. Um, again, it's easy to use because we provide some decent tools. This is a graphical user interface, which we call uh, GUI tool. Basically, it allows you to monitor what's happening on the bus, uh, to plot values, to script things, and uh, perform some sophisticated analysis of what's happening. It's also open source and hosted on GitHub. So what I just described is uh, known as UAVCAN version, um, version 1. You have again version one uh, was built uh, from our experience of deploying the first experimental version of the protocol, which, which is known as QVCAN version zero. So version zero allowed us to actually test our ideas and our engineering against real applications, not just in the simulation environments, but actually on things that go out there and fly. And UAVCAN is currently in use. And this is what UAVCAN version zero was defined for. Um, you can see that we've been covering the domain of uh, unmanned aerial vehicles, and uh, CAN was our only supported transport, specifically CAN 2.0, uh, which is a very, very limited transport. Uh, it's limited to eight uh, bytes per message and so on. Um, this is UAVCAN version zero in the world of other protocols, that other, uh, other applications, which could also possibly benefit from it. Um, it is in use. Um, last year, we ran a survey among uh, companies that are members of the Drone Code uh, Foundation. Thank you, Ramon. Uh, and we've discovered that uh, UAVCAN, is, UAVCAN version zero is used in about 12% of, uh, of vehicles. Again, that was last year, so these, these numbers are obsolete. I expect that uh, today this percentage is substantially higher. And this is UAVCAN version one. We, we are trying to generalize the protocol. I think we did that quite successfully uh, because we managed to, we've identified that communication abstractions and principles and design objectives that are valid for unmanned vehicles can be transferred onto other domains which are listed here, such as manned aircraft or robotic systems or electric vehicles, microsatellites. All of them use similar communication patterns. All of them can benefit from UAVCAN, especially so if it supports different transports. These are subjects of ongoing research. Uh, at the moment, they support CAN and CANFD reliably, so it's uh, something that is already available. And there is ongoing work on bringing UAVCAN onto Ethernet and serial transports and other applications. And this, this thing, IEEE 802 something, this is a wireless transport. Wireless is important because proper design provided, you can build a very robust communication system that leverages the dissimilarity between wired transports, such as CAN or Ethernet, and wireless transports. Uh, if you want to learn about the state of the art on this, you can Google uh, wireless avionics intercommunications. It's an interesting project. They are trying to build transports that are built on wireless interfaces onto manned aircraft. So this approach has uh, caused some of our users to raise um, concerns about the disappearance of, uh, of uh, data types and abstractions that are specific to, you, to the UAV domain from the core specification. It is important to understand that these data types are not being removed, and users who are concerned should be like should understand that their uh, abstractions are still there. We propose to transfer the ownership of. Uh, let's say, domain-specific data type definitions from the core specification into uh, entities such as drone code, which would manage its own set of data type definitions and service definitions that are uh, useful in the domain of small unmanned, unmanned vehicles. This is, uh, we're going to formalize this uh, proposal over the, uh, soon in the near future, and then we'll uh, raise it for discussion with uh, drone code stakeholders. 
besides the uh, uh, specific highly specialized uh, data types, there exist also generalized data types, such as, for example, this is uh, SI namespace, which provides very basic uh, definitions for some of the basic physical quantities, such as uh, speed, for example, or power, or energy voltage, and so on, which allow you to quickly prototype a system based on you if you can, while not requiring you to actually define your own data types. Um, it's not really intended for use in production. This is more like for quick, quick prototyping because it is expected that uh, it's always possible to build a more, more optimal system uh, with uh, custom data types. Likewise, there exist very basic primitive types such as uh, natural integers and uh, bit flags, which are also designed to fulfill the same, the same role. That was uh, on the basics of... Uh, UAV can, and the the next the next part of this presentation will be led by Scott Dixon. Mm -hmm. oh, okay, sorry. Um, right. So why am I here? Because um, I uh, recently integrated this uh, into our vehicle system, so I have recent experience with evaluating UAV can as a technology, and then actually working with it. Um, and, uh, and then working with uh, Pavel to um, uh, uh, evolve it to be the, the V1 specification that we have today. Um, so let me give you a, a bit of a background of what it looks like to industry as a value proposition. Um, first of all, it is open. Uh, it's MIT license, which is a, a license that industry likes a lot. Um, it is um, uh, in GitHub, so we can see all the source easily. And uh, the specification is open. Uh, this is uh, when I was going to um, look at um, the uh, uh, was it open um, can open. I always get it backwards. Open can can. Uh, looking at can open. You want to look at can open? Great. Yeah, they got a lot of marketing material. And you're like, okay, I want to see how it's implemented. Uh, no implementations that I can find on GitHub. Um, well, I'll read the spec and I'll do it myself. Oh, well, I I got to log in and get a password from my office and you know it's just and this is kind of a pattern I saw in some of the other projects like I want to evaluate this technology guys I don't want to like join your group before I try what the technology is it's kind of a try before you buy philosophy um, it's really useful um, UAV can it maintains um, debug tools you saw the graphical debugger uh, from v0 um, we have a, a v1 version that working on that we're excited about unfortunately it's not far enough along we have screenshots but it's a um, JavaScript UI version that is um, uh, remoted so that you have um, a, a kind of a server process and a JavaScript UI, which is really useful because sometimes you have a Raspberry Pi or some embedded um, machine that you want to have running on in, down in your hardware lab or something. Um, and now you can put this um, debugging um, uh, module in that um, uh, embedded environment, run it over TCP, and have your nice... MacBook run really fancy JavaScript UIs and visualizations. Um, didn't intend to talk about that, but um, one of the reasons I'm talking about that is uh, another slide's coming out. We could really use help. Um, a lot of us are really low-level geeks, and we'd love to have more JavaScript help in this area, especially uh, any designers. Um, documentation was really good. <coughs> Excuse me, it was really good. Um, this was a big plus. So I, I was able to um, skip ahead of slides. Uh, when I was evaluating this, uh, I was able to go into here and start reading about UAV can. No initialization and startup. This looks pretty easy. Uh, I don't want to read words. I don't like words. Words, words, words. Code. Yay. Got to this really fast. Copy, paste, put on my microcontroller. Hey, this kind of works. I, I, I can, and I can totally see how to implement it. And then I, I node spin. Okay, I get the theory of operation. I can kind of now start getting an idea. Now I want to know more. So now I can go up and I can get the uh, specification. And um, uh, that's, that's another one over here for V0. And we're, we're, you know, these, are, these are important value propositions that we will continue with, with V1. We, we want it to be the same kind of experience for industry as they start evaluating this. Um, and, and for example, um, right here is Libuay VCAN V1, uh, the implementation that I've been working on. And um, this is an automated output. Every build that we do pushes a new set of Doxygen output from that build up to the server. So you can see the build number up there. We'll, our docs go live right with our changes. Uh, let me get back to the slide here. 
um, it's forward looking as a technology. It's not encumbered by a lot of uh, junk that we don't care about. And there, there was another thing that when we were evaluating other CAN protocols, CAN, been, CAN has been around for a long time. Um, we kind of had to wade through all the stuff that was about running systems that were barely out of being pneumatic systems um, and going through stuff that had to do with um, uh, uh, robotic arms and automobiles. Uh, just to get to like the kernel, and no, we just want like the really abstracted middle part of the thing. And, and UAV can gave it to us really directly without too much um, obstruction and, and confusion, which really helped us evaluate its, um, its utility and imagine how we were going to use it going forward. Um, it also, because of the, with the V1 design, we're lowering the chance that you're going to get locked into a given bus technology. Um, CAN's been around for a long time. It's not going away. Um, CAN-FD has just come out and is becoming very popular, which is going to expand its lifetime. But um, there's a couple things. Uh, uh, automotive Ethernet's becoming very popular. Those parts are becoming very cheap. Um, it has a lot of the same value propositions as CAN. Um, who knows what else might happen? Maybe we'll finally figure out quantum radio or something, and, and CAN will become irrelevant. Um, this is trying to give you a little bit of an abstraction at your... Um, uh, 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 not uh, application layer, but uh, you know, at a low layer um, that will um, kind of protect you from that. And, and hopefully we'll, we'll be able to adapt V1 to a changing environment without disruption to the higher level code. Um, right, and DSDL is another thing that um, is a, a really great value proposition for, for industry. Um, a lot of existing CAN implementations start out as a, like a diagram on the left there. That's definitely the, the, the state that um, my team was in when we started. We had some massive CAN messages .h. Everybody used it. And you start getting a lot more engineers working on, on the program. You get several different divisions that are working on a, on a unified vehicle system. You're all got to come together somewhere. And you start coming together in this big header, and it starts getting in the way. It starts becoming a problem. Uh, with DSDL, instead, we have a, a, an interface definition language, and that interface definition language becomes the place that we collaborate. Now the various engineering teams can publish types to each other as IDL, and the engineering teams then can choose what they want to do with, with that IDL, um, e e if they want to generate C with C++ with it, whether they want to use the open source generators, whether they want to create their own and integrate it into their software. Um, those are all options with, a, with an IDL. Um, another thing that this um, makes a possibility is you could um, conceivably create a certifiable generator. So for, for um, different um, uh, like DO178 processes, you can actually certify a tool so that it can output content that will be um, under your type cert. And uh, it is conceivable that you could have a, a DSDL tool that was certified in that way. Uh, the core application functions, maybe when you're evaluating the technology, you look at some of them and think, oh, we're not going to need that. You will. Um, it turns out all of the, the core functions actually turn out to be really important once your vehicle system matures. Um, so batteries included, yeah, but just the batteries you need, just very small batteries. Um, so the heartbeat is, is really important. Um, this is one people overlook. Uh, with microcontrollers. Um, microcontrollers are, are really cool. They can reset so fast that you don't know anything's wrong. And it doesn't know anything's wrong. It just goes along, it hits a hard fault, resets, comes back up, continues to do just enough functionality to make the system think it's healthy, and go into reset, come back up. You can be flying across the country thinking you're happy as anything. Heartbeat is the one indicator that's going to tell you that. There's a, a monotonic timer in UAV can, which can be literally the only signal you know that you're, uh, something is desperately wrong and you probably need to get into a safe state. Um, get info is, is really important when your system starts sealing up and you're not able to attach JTAGs to every part and you need to start introspecting things attached to a bus. This allows you to go out and ask things on the bus. What are you? Uh, how are you configured? Uh, it gives you a, like an interactive debugging capability for your vehicle. Um, this is, uh, like some of the tools that you provide, this is something you can lock out out of a production vehicle, so it's really great for uh, flight testing and prototypes, and then if you need to go and uh, deliver something that's type cert, um, you can compile this functionality out and just stay with the actual core functions that you need to fly. Um, 
and, and diagnostics, data flow, and registers are, are similar functions that are delivered as part of the core specification. Um, plug and play is something that we were really dubious that we would need because we, we don't like the idea of dynamic stuff in the vehicle. We want to know that our vehicle is configured exactly right before we fly. Uh, the thing is, something changing in the vehicle is terrifying. But it turns out it's really useful for reasons other than you would think. And again, this is one of those things that you can choose to compile in in certain modes. Um, one of the things that's really interesting is we can use it for a manufacturing test where you need to take something that's supposed to be unique in a vehicle, but you may need to have 100 of them on a single bus as part of a manufacturing test. Plug and Play actually gives you a solution where you can create software that is really, really similar to the thing you're going to fly with the only difference that it can get its node ID dynamically. Um, node uh, software update is, uh, we always forget about the bootloaders, and UAV CAN reminds us that you are going to need a bootloader at some point. So, what changed? Um, in V0, um, this was the, the layout of the um, arbitration part of the CAM message. Um, now, I probably should mention here, so we've been talking a bit about, oh, V1's going to be protocol agnostic. Um, yes, that's an area of research. That's, that's an aspiration. Um, UAV CAN V1, though, is still very much focused on CAN and best at CAN. It is really good at CAN. So, I'm, I'm showing you the CAN arbitration frame. It is core to the protocol still. Um, this is the arbitration frame for V0, and there are three different layouts that you would have. Um, a little difficult to, to exactly figure out which layout you're in because it, it, it's, it's not like I can just show you, look at this bit, you can tell which one. But uh, with V1, through a lot of back and forth and arguing and begging Pavel to give us our protocol bit, which he finally did, um, <coughs> we were able to get it down to just two layouts. So any UAV CAM message will have only one of these two layouts, and it has to do with um, the uh, service not message bit. Um, you'll, you'll either have a uh, 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 kind of an RPC style uh, or a pub sub style message. Um, and then, yeah, this thing that I, uh, Chettle and I argued about quite a bit. Protocol version bit is yet another. Uh, so I just showed you we broke the binary protocol from V0 to V1, the wire protocol, which is a little scary, and you're probably asking me why. This is one of the reasons why, one of the biggest reasons why I'm really okay with it. Um, this future proof stuff now. We have a bit so that if we got something desperately wrong, now we do have that one bit where in the future, I can say, you know what, V2 is going to have to come out, not planning on it, but it's going to have to come out, and V2 is going to set that bit to 1. And now we have a really good forward compatibility story. And uh, the biggest thing, data types. So V0 was terrifying because the data types had no versioning story whatsoever. And uh, this was definitely me do not want to manufacture millions of devices and have no story about what am I going to do if I need to change the data type. Um, I'm not going to go into too much uh, detail on exactly how the revisioning works. It's a binary protocol. It's very low level and static, so the revisioning is a little bit nuanced. But it's in the specification. Um, I want to give a call out to Cheto, who is, uh, was one of the three that met to um, start kick off the V1 uh, process. And this link down here, You'll see he had, um, he was really key to getting the, the, the protocol, the data type versioning correct. He argued long and hard and really well thought through arguments. If anything else, this, um, this uh, thread on the forum is just a really great example of engineers collaborating in an open source setting. I would, I would recommend it for, for that reason alone. And um, back to you. Yeah, thank you. So this part is going to be very brief. Uh, here we basically outline the current status of our implementations. Um, you can see that uh, C and Python implementations are already usable. Uh, the Python implementation is actually designed to support different transports already, although these parts are not yet in the specification. As I say, this is uh, something that is currently under active research. But can FD or CAN 2.0 can be used already? Uh, LibUAVCAN is kind of being worked on. It is not quite usable. Some work remains to be done. Uh, but I'm here. So. <laughs> <laughs> uh, then there is a Rust implementation which requires like, 
which must be worked on quite let me talk about that real quick, because that was a selling point for us. We liked that there was Rust not because we wanted to use it, but because it told us that the community was looking ahead and researching things and thinking beyond what it knew. I'd really love to have somebody pick up Rust for V1 and, and, and restore that. Yes, I, I am personally a big believer in Rust. Um, I think this is, it has the potential to be a great solution for safety critical software development. At the moment, it's uh, kind of in its early days still. Uh, there is effort which you might have heard of. Uh, it's called Seal Addressed. Uh, its objective is to uh, provide a certified and validated implementation of a Rust compiler to make this language usable in safety critical systems on par with ADA or C. Um, so we want to be on board with that because I think that this is a great trend which, is, which has the potential to perhaps significantly displace C from certain safety critical domains. Uh, this is our proposal, how to bring UAVCAN version 1 to PX4. So obviously this is not something that uh, we finalized because as I said, this is merely a proposal. This is something that we want to discuss. Uh, the plan is to integrate UAVCAN version 1 into the release of PX4 following version 1.10, so that's uh, due in March of the next year. And then there's going to be a transitory period and until uh, version 1.10, which we expect to be the last version supporting UAVCAN version 0, reaches the end of its life cycle. And after that, it's going to be consistently version 1. It is extremely important to perform this transition sooner rather than later because we know that there are certain vendors, uh, our Chinese partners and others, who are working on new generation of UAV products, which will be UAV CAN enabled. And it is important to ensure that we roll out the transition to version one before this uh, products, this new products reach the market. Because if we fail to do so, if we delay the transition, then the ecosystem will be fragmented which could be very disastrous for the specification. And um, a good thing is that we have already secured the necessary human resources for this transition. Uh, and I think the, the general process is uh, pretty well defined, so there are very, the, the risk of this transition should be very low. Um, now, there is a particular question that uh, we get asked frequently is, uh, how does one use UAV CAN version zero? And uh, there is no better answer than to just go ahead and look at the website, new.uavcan.org, new because it stands for version one. Uh, go here and read whatever is published there and that will bring you up to speed. You will know everything that there is to know to be able to build a UAV CAN application, software, hardware, product, research, whatever. Now, this is on the future of UAV CAN. Would you like to take over here? All right, so the remaining work that we have um, for uh, UAV CAN V1. Um, we need to finish the reference implementations, and from what Pavel's telling me, that means I need to finish the C++ rep, uh, reference implementation. Um, finish the, the new tool type. So the Yukon tool that I was telling you about um, is lagging behind the rest of the project, and that's that's an area where we uh, could use more help and more input. An area that I think is is really critical for um, V1 to be widely uh, adopted going forward. Um, we need to define and deploy the type management process that we're talking about. So we were saying we didn't delete your types, we promoted them. They're something we're going to work with outside of the specification, but we haven't yet said how we're going to work with the types. We owe the community that, and that's gonna be something that we do in short order. Um, I think maybe I, I could talk a little bit more about that. Um, so what we're hoping is that um, PX4 has a, a set of types that it's interested in. But there could be other industries or other projects that also are interested in UAV CAN that want to have their own namespace. And this process will allow us to manage those things independently. So if you had somebody that was interested in, I don't know, a factory automation, um, it would be very hard to collaborate with them in the drone community. You, you, you would have very different um, 
uh, ways of looking at some uh, at these data types and at the interfaces. This this allows us to, to parallelize those standardization efforts. Um, and uh, we want to lower the, the entry bar barrier. We want to make it easier to um, uh, evaluate and adopt V1 to play with it. Um, I think play is a very uh, powerful tool for engineers to be able to tinker and poke and prod at it and get to learn through that way. Um, so hopefully we'll have some solutions that'll make it a little more fun. Um, Pavel, you want to talk about your, your directional oh, yes. vision? Uh yeah, I love this picture because I, I love this this kind of um, these kinds of applications where you can just point and click and connect things together. This is something that we have on our roadmap. Uh, Scott mentioned uh, that we are working on a new graphical user interface, Yukon, and uh, these capabilities on the roadmap basically what it allows you to do is to uh, connect Yukon to a CAN bus containing several nodes, and you can configure them by uh, connecting together different th their re representations, and uh, that will allow you to easily configure a possibly very complex system uh, and look at the way it's configured uh, in this, this kind of human-friendly visualization. Uh, again, people who are familiar with ROS will find certain similarities with uh, ROS graph and uh, other ROS visual visualization tools. There are a lot of parallels to be made. Um, briefly, what we are working on, this is the, the current status of the project. As been said, uh, new transports are currently the area of active research. Uh, lowering the entry barrier is extremely important uh, because that's the sort of feedback that we've been receiving from the community that certain aspects might be a bit hard to grasp and we are working hard to ensure that every developer can easily start with UVCAN and get up to speed. Um, we, we are striving very hard to ensure that uh, our software, our reference implementations adhere to the to highest quality standards. We use linters, uh, we use uh, MISRA and the other high reliability coding standards, uh, static verification, and most importantly, everything is on GitHub. Uh, one of the plans for V1 for near-term plans is to ensure that it is deployed in at least uh, two large-scale vehicle systems. One of them perhaps could be PX4. We'll see how it goes. Um, we'll, after that, uh, we would have received sufficient uh, validation, empirical validation of this technology, which would allow us to uh, launch the process of formal standardization of the protocol, because by that point it will be actually, as you put it, battle-proven and verified against real fielded applications, not just research. Um, should we elaborate on standardization? Uh, other than it, it's, it's a very desirable goal to, to get to. So yes, once we, once we have it deployed in two vehicle systems, that kind of gives us enough confidence that V1 is something we want to standardize, and then um, I know I'm personally very interested in, and I've gotten some commitment from my company to, to back some of this, to approach some standards body and um, get this uh, uh, specification written up through that standard. I think it's higher bus factor after all. Yes. Yeah. So objective is to increase the bus factor, and that means uh, <laughs> re reducing the number of... Uh, actually increasing the number of key people who are necessary for the survival of the project. Um, I'm not exactly sure what are the logistics of this approach, but this is an important goal. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, it, it does go to, um, uh, one of the things I, I, I didn't mention that I meant to um, about in the evaluation is um, project health of an open source project. And there were a few other um, uh, projects out there that um, maybe had similar value propositions to UAV can, but uh, appeared to be all but abandoned, if not dead. Uh, so it's very important that the UAV can project remain a um, healthy open source project to maintain that value proposition through V1. And it's very important that Pavel does not get hit by a bus right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so as been said, uh, we have uh, tentatively secured some HR, some uh, human resources necessary for 
uh, maintenance of UAV can within the scope of drone code in PX4 project. So that's uh, uh, something that's more or less resolved at this point. Briefly, that's it. Uh, UAV can V1 uh, is in a state where it can be safely used for new projects, new deployments. Uh, we are committed to provide support to UAVKN version 0. It is not getting deprecated overnight. We know that there are users and products out there that depend on it, and it is our hard commitment to ensure that they continue safe operation. Uh, and uh, again, this is very important, which is why we reiterate we are continuing ongoing research on uh, uh, different transport protocols, including heterogeneous transport protocols. Uh, there is a pretty long write-up written in bad English on the forum. Uh, you will be able to click this link uh, afterwards and uh, understand the, the background, what we've been working on. Who here's heard of heterogeneous redundancy before? Anybody? I briefly mentioned it. You, you did briefly mention it, but it's, 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 it's something it's, that as soon as you hear about it, you're like, oh, wow, I really should have thought of that before. It's something very interesting and yeah, very so new. Yeah, if so you, if you have a redundant CAN bus, um, the failure mode that you're going to experience on one of those buses is probably the exact same failure mode you're going to experience in the other. Um, f for one thing, it's probably going to be your connector. It's probably going to be the same connector, and it's probably going to be experiencing the same vibration, and they're probably both going to fail. So what did the two buses buy you? Heterogeneous redundancy means you should have two completely heterogeneous solutions so that those failure modes are different. Um, one of the really striking examples, if you think about an airplane wing, if you have multiple hydraulic lines going to the control surfaces and an engine blows up, it's just going to cut through all the hydraulic lines. So this wireless standard that, that Pablo is talking about was a, it was a very innovative solution to that. Well, let's have the redundant thing be wireless. So, yeah, you've got a wire there. It gets cut, and now you can use the, the wire connection to go past there, the catastrophic failure, and still control the emergency equipment. Yeah. Different failure modes, that's the key. Again, this post, uh, this uh, this uh, slide is more useful for those who will be looking at this presentation afterwards. Uh, click this link, to go ahead, read what we've been working on. There is a lot of great stuff out there. Last but not least, UAV can kind of means uh, can bus for UAV, but this uh, interpretation is slowly becoming obsolete. We hope to ensure that this acronym remains the only complex thing in the protocol. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, guys. <laughs> that was a great talk, guys. Thank you. Uh, is there any questions from the audience? Um, I don't know. <laughs> Go ahead. question was, uh, it seems that you're targeting the same uh, goals as Ross. What is the difference? What are the different goals? Um, I think it's best to answer this question with a picture. One picture is worth 1,024 words. So UAVCAN is all the way on the left part of this chart, which means that it is safe. It is, uh, it is easy to ensure that it's, it performs according to the specification. Um, there is a specification for UAV CAN. There is probably no well-defined formal specification for ROS. You might disagree. I'm not exactly sure. No. Okay. Uh, that is a very important differentiator because it allows you to track requirements of a UAV CAN implementation, and that makes it suitable for safety-critical deployment. Also, it is very simple. 1,000 lines of code get you a working system. That is something that that is manageable, that can be cheaply validated. That is the main distinguishing factor. For a developer, for somebody who uses UAV CAN as opposed to performs its deployment, it's more or less, it's at least familiar if they are familiar with ROS. I hope that makes sense. Uh, it's also very statically defined. Everything is determined at compile time. So that um, makes it much easier to, to verify. And um, it also does, uh, it allows you to verify and assert certain properties of the entire vehicle bus at compilation time.
I don't see that. To, to me, it, yeah. it's that you. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Repeat the question. Yeah. Can you repeat the question? Okay. Uh, so let me see. If I, it, it seems like what you're saying that it's a one or the other situation, and they can't live together in the same vehicle system. Um, I don't think that. Uh, I don't think that's necessarily true. I, uh, that's not my vision of it. Um, I would imagine that UAV can is a lower level protocol. Um, you, you could have some versions where. Um, you're integrating where Ross is going over UAV CAN is a possibility, but it's probably more likely that there are like boundaries where you've got lower level peripherals that are talking UAV CAN to some kind of, of uh, a switch or intermediate that then goes into the, the Ross domain. Yeah, I think the uh, application domains of Ross and UAV CAN, they don't overlap significantly. Carl? Um, so I have a question. Um, I just started with the uh, UAV CAM project, and I have now like my laptop talking to two PX4 nodes running Pi UAV CAN on the laptop and Lib UAV CAN on the PX4 nodes. Um, when will I be able to run UAV CAN 1.0 as easily as it was with 0 0.9? Yeah. Um, so. Pavel claims, and I haven't had time to verify, that you, Pi UEV CAN is ready to do that level of testing, right? It is technically ready. It works. You can do things, but uh, we're still working on the documentation to make sure that the ender barrier is acceptably low. So at the moment, it's a bit difficult to use, but we are working on that. Technically, it's there. And the C++ implementation, um, I kind of threw a, a dartboard at a calendar and set an alpha in August. So a rough da a date from an engineer, you really trust those. And there is great documentation for Libre if you can. Scott made it. Thank you. I have a question regarding uh, multiple physical layers. Is there any plan to integrate routing between those different physical, like having a device on CAN talk to a device that has CAN and wireless talk to a device that has only wireless and send messages transparently? So I think that there actually exist very sensible use cases for that, uh, and you can find similar similar patterns deployed in uh, actual uh, safety critical aerospace applications. For example, a bridge between uh, our CAN standard and FDX is something that uh, that is used frequently in uh, in airliners, for example, where they connect uh, avionics installed on a wing tip to the main FDX bus. So that is something that that, that makes sense. Any other questions? I'm going to take this guy first. Uh, so you showed on one of the slides with your 29-bit identifier, you had like four priority bits. How are those configured, and is that effectively a message priority or a node priority? Uh, so it's a priority is generally configured per uh, per publisher, and actually there are three link three uh, priority bits. Uh, let me find this slide for general reference. Where is it? That is uh, something that can be arbitrarily chosen per publisher, actually per message. One follow-on question to that. It, does this represent all of the overhead for UAV CAN? Because with There's the 29 bit, That's not overhead. That's an arbitration frame in CAN, so... Right, I understand. So there's about 50% quote-unquote overhead when you're using 29-bit identifiers. So are you adding anything on top of that, or do you fit everything right in here? There is one extra byte. Yep. Okay. Hi, Pavel. There was one, one part I didn't quite catch. You said at one point there was static configuration of, or the preferred method was static configuration, but then you also talked about plug and play. So plug and play is an option, something that you can implement if you believe your application can benefit from it, but it is actually something that we, we don't recommend to use in this specification. There is a footnote that says that this thing is available, but most likely your application will not benefit from it. It's there because there are certain corner cases where this is useful, such as one that Scott mentioned, testing and similar similar use cases. So in the case, let's say you have um, uh, multiple battery packs where there may actually be multiple types of battery packs that are all CAN bus, is that still you would cover all the potential ones that got plugged in as a static case and then, or would you want that as a dynamic service? Um, so actually there are like different options available. Uh, yes. In order to answer this question comprehensively, <laughs> I would have to ask you a lot 
of, okay. of follow-up questions. I'm not going to do that right now, but briefly, both approaches are possible. Both approaches make sense depending on the constraints of your application. Yeah, and, and I think the, the note that says you shouldn't use plug-and-play in your system is kind of a system-level note. It's not that the, it's an inherently broken protocol or of course. dangerous. Of it's course. just, as a note, you probably shouldn't be swapping node IDs while you're flying around. Um, it's similar to how embedded systems, you shouldn't be allocating memory normally when you're running. Um, you, it, but you have this exception sometimes where you just allocate one chunk at the beginning, and now you're initialized, and now you're running statically. It, it, you, can, you can imagine doing a system like that where in startup, I'm allowed to plug and play. I'm allowed to allocate the stuff, and then we get into the we're configured mode. I'm not allowed to do that anymore. Yeah. I mean, I could uh, another a scenario would be a, uh, if you picked up a payload and then wanted to have that as part of the system, uh, you might want to be dynamic in that kind of a situation as well. Yeah. Okay. Anyone else? Uh, we got one down here. Down here? Julian. Can you repeat the question, please? Uh, yeah, so during the, trans the period of transition from V0 to V1, uh, PX4, the question is whether PX4 will support both protocols. I think that it would be feasible to support this through a compile time switch. I don't think that it makes sense to build both uh, versions of the protocol because the footprint, the ROM footprint, would be probably prohibitive. But Again, this is something that can be discussed. I think uh, UAV can at this point costs like, uh, specifically in the case of Peaks, so it's like 20K or something. Anyone else? Perfect. Uh, thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you.